Thanks, John. As most of you know, we don't normally pass the offering basket during the service because, frankly, uh, they just get too heavy. People put in so much money. The, uh, uh, so what we do is we put them on the back and we ask you to uh, put your offering in there or give online or arrange something with, with Didi. So we don't normally pass the offering basket, but this morning during the offertory, uh, we're going to pass the offering basket. Um, Because believe it or not, uh, you are the offering that God desires. So uh, that's a little freaky if you're new, um, because uh, the offerings in the Old Testament uh, went through a knife and a fire and this curtain, but uh, we actually are the sacrifice that God desires, the offering that he desires. Um, So we're going to pass the basket, but the problem is that most of you don't fit in the basket. So what I want you to do with your piece of paper, all right, uh, I think you all have a piece of paper and a pencil. If you don't, John and Susan have, have more. Uh, it, during, during the offertory, uh, Anthony is just going to play music for the first couple of minutes, and I want you to define yourself, all right? So if you were at a party and someone said, hey, dude, who are you? W- what, would you what would you tell them? Um, you'd probably describe yourself and you'd list uh, your successes, the reasons that you like yourself. On one side of the paper, I want you to write down the reasons, uh, the things you feel good about, all right, Uh, your successes. And on the other side, I want you to quickly write down the things that you wouldn't want to say, Uh, your failures, uh, the things that you maybe don't like about yourself. And then when, and and by the way, you're going to have to do this quickly, okay? So it's just a summary, and you're going to, Keep the, the process going in your head. Um, when the music, when Anthony starts singing, then John and Susan will collect the, the offering, which is your pieces of paper, and bring them forward. So don't sign them because uh, you're bringing them forward, and, well, God already knows who you are, okay? So, Lord God, we offer ourselves to you this morning. It's a little bit freaky that you don't, just want our money, and we thank you for that, and, and we offer that um, like we normally do. I'm, I'm just clarifying this for folks, Lord. Um, but Father, I pray that right now you would help us to offer what it is that you truly want, ourselves. So Lord God, we thank you that this is the offering that you desire, and we thank you that you even give us the power to offer it. And so, Lord, now we ask that you would inhabit us and, um, Lord, listen uh, through us and speak through us and cause us to be consecrated. Uh, Consecrate us, Lord God, for your purposes and for your pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. I wasn't here last week, but in Tucson, uh, seeing my son Coleman. But the week before, we finished uh, kind of a preaching series through the book of First Peter. And this week, we're starting Second Peter, which comes after First Peter. Two books with great titles. Anyway, at the start of First Peter, Peter announces uh, the gospel, and then he remember he says this: "Gird up the loins of your mind." In other words, think differently. So 1 Peter, if you remember, was a gestalt shift, a paradigm uh, shift, in order that we would repent. And repent means to think differently about everything. And so as we were preaching through 1 Peter, I started making a list of descriptions of this paradigm shift, but I never had really time to, to share it. So as a way of summing up 1 Peter, I'd like to quickly share some of the list right now. It's also printed in your S News that you're holding, and you can get a copy of this at the Information Center uh, afterwards. Um, And uh, we're going to have to do this real quick, so we're just going to skim it, 
But that's okay, because it's review, right? Okay, the paradigm shift that we found in 1 Peter. You are not the creator, but the created. You can do nothing until you are aware that you are being done. You are not responsible until God makes you able to respond. You cannot choose except as the chosen. You are not free until the truth sets you free with awareness that you're a slave. You are not salvation, Mises. God is salvation, Jesus. You are not an adult, you are a baby. You, must, you are not logical, you must drink some else's logic, which is only logical. You cannot build the temple. You and your neighbor are the temple that's being built. Your life does not belong to you. You belong to the life, and you're as good as dead until you know that you do. You cannot truly live until you freely choose to die, to sacrifice your life. This is called love. Life is a communion of sacrificial love. Forgiveness does not pay for love. It is love. God is love. The spirit of love is imperishable. Flesh will perish. You are begotten of imperishable seed, begotten of I am, planted in I am not. This world is not a test to see who gets to heaven. This world is a test so that you can enjoy heaven when you get there. Uh, faith is refined by fire. Our temptation is to tempt God, to put God to the test. He passes the test and creates faith, although it hurts like hell for him, the faithful one. It's not your choice that saves you from God's choice. It's God's choice that saves you from your choices by implanting his choice within you. You're not saved because God killed Jesus in your place. You're saved because God raised Jesus in your place. He is God's choice. Jesus doesn't simply share in your sufferings. You always share in his. He is how you are made in the image of God. Our experience of space-time is our inability to perceive eternity, the telos, the end, the perfection that is at hand. Jesus, who will not leave us or forsake us. Reality is not what you know, but who it is that knows you. You cannot just decide to have a paradigm shift because a paradigm shift is how you decide. Something or someone needs to shift you. <laughs> someone needs to wake you up. We can only know because we are known. Okay, got it? All right. That's a summary of 1 Peter. Most scholars agree, uh, or uh, they, but they would, most scholars would argue that uh, 1 Peter was not written by Peter. Um, and, and yet many moderns, or most scholars, yeah, what am I trying to say? That's the summary for most scholars. Okay, I'm going to look at my notes. It got confusing there. Um, most modern scholars will argue that First Peter wasn't written by First Peter, by Peter. Although, um, the church fathers include, uh, or, okay, I see what's wrong here in my head. First Peter, most scholars argue, was written by First Peter. Um, but when it gets to Second Peter, a lot of scholars argue that it wasn't written by Peter, even though the church fathers and the people that formed the canon said that it was written uh, by Peter, most of them. And they say, they, they, the modern scholars say this, that they think Second Peter wasn't written by Peter for a couple of reasons. And, and the reasons... Here's a few of them. Number one, that the Greek syntax and vocabulary in 2 Peter is different than 1 Peter. But you may remember in our last sermon, we talked about the fact that Peter says that it, Silvanus or Silas helped him write it, which was normal in that day. Silas was a secretary and, and Greek wasn't Peter's original language. Um, we don't know who may have helped him write Second Peter. So, so that's one reason they say it. I think another reason they say it, which may be an even bigger reason, is that Second Peter is scary. Now, scholars are not going to put it that way, but I can tell, I think we can tell that's, that's what they're thinking. They'll say it sounds like Peter is saying that you better get your act together or else. They say it sounds like moralism and condemnation. And Second Peter does talk about evil people doing evil things, and then how God will keep them under punishment until the judgment, at which time all creation will be consumed by fire. So Second Peter can scare the hell out of you. But I think if we wrestle with it, it might just love a little heaven into us. So, um, as, I, as I was saying, some think that 2 Peter is different than, say that 2 Peter is different than 1 Peter, but I would suggest that they think 2 Peter is different than 1 Peter because they haven't yet believed 1 Peter. The paradigm hasn't shifted. 
And hopefully today I can just begin to show you what I, what I mean by that. So we don't know to whom the epistle of 2 Peter was sent, but we do know that 2 Peter is the second letter that Peter sent to these recipients and that they might be the same people to whom he sent uh, 1 Peter, that is some churches in Asia Minor. And we do know that when Peter wrote this letter, he was convinced that he was about to die. So it would have been written sometime in the, in the 60s, like around 67 or 8. He knew that he was about to die or live, depending on your paradigm. 2 Peter 1 verse 1. Simeon Peter, a servant, slave, and apostle of Jesus Christ. Simon is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Simeon. So, so Simeon is evidence that Peter himself wrote this letter because someone pretending to be Peter would have used Simon. Simeon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained, lagkano, that's fascinating because it literally means to obtain by lot. In other words, what's obtained it wasn't the result of our choice, um, someone else's choice, who have obtained uh, by lot a faith of equal standing with ours in the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge, epigenosis, thorough and precise knowledge, the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted, uh, given to us, graced us with all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, the epigenosis uh, of him. Now, I hope you can see that knowledge of him, this knowledge of Jesus, which is knowledge of God, is tremendously important, right? Because it's through this knowledge that we receive all things having to do with life and godliness, which is, I think, basically everything. This knowledge is tremendously important, but the Greek is not entirely clear about whose knowledge it is. I mean, in the Greek text, there is no of, just knowledge God, knowledge Jesus, and knowledge him. The, the word of is supplied by the translator, and I think correctly by the translator uh, but he has to put something in there because God and Jesus in him are in the genitive case in Greek, which means that Peter could be referring to God and Jesus as the objects that are known. That's called an objective genitive. Or Peter could be referring to God and Jesus as the subject that does the knowing. That's called the subjective genitive. So you see, Peter could be talking about knowing or being known or both. And that brings up this utterly fascinating question that modern people just seem to absolutely and entirely ignore, and that question is whether or not knowledge is good or evil. For me, for, for much of my life, that was the most perplexing question in all of Scripture. And no one seemed to be willing to talk about it. In John 17, 3, Jesus prays to his father saying this, listen closely, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So in John 17, Jesus claims that knowledge is eternal life, and I would think that eternal life is good, right? Genesis 2, 17, God says to Ha-Adam, the Adam who is us, he says, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat, for in the day you eat of it, dying you will die. And you know the story, right? Humanity does eat of it and gains some sort of knowledge, but dying we die. To me, that seems kind of evil. I mean, not good. So is knowledge good or evil? Life or death. That's perplexing. And, and this is also perplexing, but thoroughly fascinating. In Scripture, there appear to be two very different ways of 
obtaining knowledge. Two ways of knowing. You can come to know by taking knowledge like fruit from a tree. That's objective knowledge, right? The thing that you know is an object which you analyze. That's also called empiricism or science leading to technology. And it's great. It's awesome for knowing about things that you consider less than yourself, which you can then use in service of yourself. It's great for knowing about objects, and some people think that it's the only kind of knowledge that there is. So for those people that think that objective knowledge is the only knowledge that there is, all that they know is what? Objects. And so everything has died by definition, including themselves, for they are utterly alone. They are what? They are the one subject in an entire universe of objects. Shit. To me, that sounds like hell. So number one, I can know by taking knowledge like I would take fruit from a tree. Or number two, I can know because I've received knowledge like a kiss on the cheek from my wife. Number one, I could dissect my wife and know all about my wife, but she'd be dead. Or number two, I could let my wife kiss me on the cheek and know because I've allowed myself to be known. That's the only way, you know, that a little child can know anything. They have to trust someone other than themselves. When my children were little, they really didn't know anything about me, and yet they knew me. And so I delighted in telling them about myself, and they delighted in seeing themselves reflected in the pupil of my eye. On the other hand, the doctor, the IRS, even the FBI, because Susan's dad was involved in the defense industry, they knew all about me, but they didn't know me. And I had no interest in kissing them or confiding in them, and they seemed to have no interest in seeing themselves reflected in the pupil of my eye. In 1999, Martha Beck published a book titled Expecting Adam, all about her relationship with her son Adam, who had Down syndrome. So in many ways, Adam always remained a child. At one point, she writes about trying to teach Adam how to read and how Adam could could not seem to connect abstract symbols like the letter E, to objects like ear or egg. But one day she realized that he could connect those symbols to the names of people. That is, subjects that he knew because they had known him and knew him like his sister Elizabeth. She writes, Instead of a rationally constructed structure of empirical observations, logical conclusions, and arbitrary symbols, Adam's mental world seems to be more like a a huge family reunion. Long before he could read or write, or so I thought, Adam came home to tell me in his garbled tongue about the new boy who had just moved into his class and who had become Adam's friend. When I couldn't understand his pronunciation of the boy's name, Adam grabbed a pencil on his stubby, grubby little boy fingers and wrote Miguel Fernando de la Hoya on a piece of paper, a piece of paper, needless to say, which I intend to frame. If I ever need a dose of Adam and he isn't around, I'll be able to look at that clumsily written name and remember what it is like to tap into an intelligence powered exclusively by love. Adam. Expecting Adam. Maybe the entire universe is expecting Adam. When my children were little, they delighted and seeing themselves reflected in the pupil of my eye. They were the apple of my eye. That's how they knew who they were. That's how they knew themselves. And they delighted in imitating me. I mean, it was as if they thought they were me. So they didn't try. They they just did it. But at a certain age, they gained knowledge of me and began to try to be me because they thought they weren't me. 
They began to judge themselves in order to make themselves in my image. So they, they began to try to impress me, and so they'd, they'd hide their hearts from me. And then it was weird. It was like they began to resent me and resent each other. I think they call it junior high, but it started much earlier than that. It felt like dying, they were beginning to die. And yet they have always been the apple of my eye, even if buried in like a cloak of shame and fig leaves, even if they wouldn't look in my eye. So maybe knowledge is not the issue in the way that we think it's the issue, but how we obtain knowledge is the very definition of evil and of good. There's one way of knowing that results in death, and there's another way of knowing or being known that is life and results in life, and even sometimes babies. Genesis 2.9, we read this, that the tree of life was in the middle of the garden, and in the same spot, the middle, was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God alone is good, said Jesus. So if the good was incarnate and hanging on a tree in a garden, wouldn't it look just like like this? I am the life, said Jesus. So if the life was incarnate and hanging on a tree in a garden, wouldn't it also look just like this? As you know, Peter refers to the cross as a tree, and Peter's friend John makes a big deal out of the fact that this tree called the cross stood in a garden on a holy mountain. And both Peter and John have taught us that we are the temple on that holy mountain. And Jesus is to be enthroned in the holy of holies in the temple of our souls between the cherubim at the edge of time and eternity. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom, which is like living knowledge, right? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, wrote Paul. So if you saw that he was good for food, you know, like something you could consume, something you could eat, and to be desired to make one wise, and so you helped yourself to him and took his life, well, he would die. And everything would die, for he is the life. And you would know evil for you just crucified the good. You would have objective knowledge of the crucified Christ, knowledge of evil and knowledge of the good, dead good, dead knowledge. But if he rose from the dead and you surrendered to him as the life, then you would have subjective knowledge of the risen Christ. You would have knowledge of good and evil and you would simultaneously be known by the life who is the good and whose absence is evil. You might even, you might even get pregnant with life. The fruit of the Spirit, His Spirit, for after all, He is our helper and we are His bride, the bride of Christ. That means something. He's the truth. The truth. The beauty the life, and in him all things hold together. So maybe you encounter him like all the time. Maybe you surrender him or to him sometimes. Maybe you crucify him sometimes all the time. So when Peter writes, his divine power His divine power has graced us, given to us all things to life and godliness in the knowledge of him. I'm guessing subjective genitive. (laughs) See, I don't think Peter is suggesting that we take more knowledge of good and evil. I think he's testifying to the fact that we are known by God and thereby know God. We're not saved by what we know, but the one who knows us and implants his promises in us like imperishable seed. Listen closely to what Paul wrote. This is the coolest verse, I think. If anyone imagines that he knows something, do you? Like this? (laughs) If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known. 
by God. God is love, wrote John. Love is the divine nature, theos physis. So verse 3, his divine power has given to us, granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted us, given to us, his precious and very great promises. Promises like, when I am lifted up, I will draw people to myself. And individual promises like, you're rocky, and on this rock I will build my church. Promises so that through them you become partakers, kononos, communicants of the divine nature, theos physis. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of desire, epithumia. What desire is Peter talking about? I think he's obviously talking about Eve's desire to take from the fruit from the tree in order to justify herself, save herself, redeem herself, and create herself to make herself in the image of God. That's our desire. That's Eve's desire. But according to Scripture, Jesus also has a desire. Eve's desire is to take the life of Christ. And Jesus' desire, the second Adam's desire, is to give his own life such that Eve would receive his own life and surrender her life to the logic of love. So we desire to consume the life, and the life desires to commune with us. He's our helper, our husband, our head. Epithumia, epithumesa, in desire I have desired, in lust I have lusted, said Jesus to the twelve, to eat this Passover with you, which we call communion. Second Peter 1.5, for this very reason. You see, apparently, uh, some of the people that Peter was writing to must have been teaching that grace meant that we're to do nothing. That's what people think sometimes. When in reality, grace means that for the very first time, we can begin to do everything, rather than the nothing that we have always done. 2 Peter 1.5, for this very reason, because of grace, contribute every effort, all diligence, to supplement epicora geo, uh, the faith of you. Now, that is a challenging verse to translate into English, so stick with me, and I think you can get this. The imperative verb in this sentence, the thing that we're being commanded to do, is this verb epikorageo in Greek, which comes from two other Greek words, epi, which is the preposition, uh, combined with the Greek verb korageo, which literally means to lead a chorus, to choreograph. In Colossians, Paul writes that the whole body is epikorageo, choreographed by the head. So a literal translation of 2 Peter 1, 5 is, for this very reason, to contribute all diligence, choreograph, that is, dance and sing the faith, not your faith, the faith, dance and sing the faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control. Self-control, you know, is listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit, along with faith and love. Dance and sing self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Notice that it all starts with faith, which Peter, Paul, and John claim is like an imperishable seed. And it ends with love, which is God himself. Sing and dance the faith in you with goodness, knowledge, self under control, steadfastness, godliness, affection, and love. To sing... What do you have to do? You have to like surrender to the logic of the song, right? To dance, you have to lose yourself and then find yourself dancing. I struggle to sing because of the opinions of several people and my own over the years, and so I am self-conscious about my voice. I struggle to dance because I'm constantly judging all the, the dance steps. I'm conscious of me, and so I'm unconscious of the logic of the song. To sing or dance is to surrender your logic to a greater logic, right? The logic of the song that coordinates all the body parts in each and every moment. 
Jesus is the logic of God. He's the head of everybody that's anybody who choreographs everything in the kingdom of God, the new creation. You know, little kids, they just sing and dance at the drop of a hat. Well, and by that I mean freely. They sing well, dance well, because they so easily lose themselves because they just don't have a whole lot of self to lose. They cry well, laugh well, for they're rather incapable of judging themselves. And they sleep well. I don't sleep well. Jesus said that we must become like little children to enter the kingdom. And for most of his life, I mean, at least up until the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus lived like a little child, didn't he? Jesus even told us that there were things he, he did not know. At least not after he had emptied himself and taken the form of a, of a slave. And yet it was as if he constantly knew something or someone that we did not know. He knew that he was constantly known and loved by God our Father. He heard the Father say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And so I, I think this is one of the most amazing things about Jesus. Did you know that he fell asleep in a little boat on top of the sea, which was a picture of hell for the Jews, in a raging storm? When the terrified disciples woke him crying, we're perishing, we're perishing. It was like he was genuinely confused by their fear. And then he told the storm to stop. He must have known this is what dad wanted him to do because like a child, he said he only did what he saw his father doing. His dad did it and so he, he did it. He told the storm to stop and, and the storm stopped. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked his father to stop an even fiercer storm, but, but then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus sank beneath the waves into all of our anxieties and all of our fears, and yet God raised him from the grave. And in this way, he stopped every storm. Well, on the Sea of Galilee that day, he slept in a storm, told it to stop, and it did. And then uh, the, the, he, he asked the disciples, where's your faith? Looking at him. Answer? Right in front of him. Faith in us is Christ in us, said St. Augustine. Uh, we are saved by grace through the faith of Jesus, subjective genitive, for Jesus is the faithful one. And faith, and faith is... Well, faith is what the first Adam was lacking, <laughs> isn't it? Okay, so verse 8. For if these qualities, sorry to keep asking all these hard questions, but is faith a, a quality? The ESV, I think, is a, is a pretty good translation, but it's obvious that the translators are struggling in Second Peter. And I think this is because they're looking through the wrong paradigm. The words if and qualities are just totally missing, are missing from the text. Only for and the pronoun these. And, and these obviously modifies faith, virtue, love, the, the things that Peter just listed. But you see, love is not simply a quality of other things. Love is the foundation of everything. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never fails. God is love and real love is God. These obviously refers to the theos physis, the divine nature. So verse 8, for these in you existing, this is a literal translation, for these in you existing and increasing establish you, stand you, not ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The knowledge of our Lord Jesus. We're talking subjective genitive. Bride of Christ. Bride of Christ, you see, it's not your knowledge, and I hope I don't have to explain this to you, but, but it's not your knowledge of the bridegroom that makes you fruitful. 
In fact, taking knowledge from the bridegroom can do just the opposite. Kill the bridegroom and render you barren. What makes you fruitful is allowing the bridegroom to know you, to undress you of your fig leaves in fear, and then fill you with himself, the promised and imperishable seed, the logic of God, the judgment of, of God. Or I could say it this way, children of God is not your lack of knowledge about your father that makes you unrighteous or unfit. What makes you unrighteous is that you have forgotten that you are entirely known and thoroughly loved. Verse 9, for whoever lacks these, whoever lacks these is so nearsighted, so unable to see past his own self, that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Whoever, 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 whoever lacks these was cleansed. Whoever. Whether or not they're even aware of their friend, sins, which you see, for me, is good news. Because if I'm honest with you, there are things that appeared on one side of my sheet that also appeared on the other side of my sheet. As if I couldn't sort the wheat from the tares inside of me. The good and, and the evil. Whoever lacks these Faith and love, whoever sins, because that's sin, if you lack faith and you lack love, that's what sin is. Whoever sins has forgotten that he has been cleansed of his former sins. Wow! I mean, if I take that seriously, it means that everyone, unless of course there's someone that never sinned, it means that everyone has been forgiven, and whoever does sin is simply unaware of this incredible news called the gospel. And so it's dangerous to read the rest of Second Peter and even attempt to translate Second Peter or the Bible if we don't believe the gospel. For the accuser will turn the gospel into knowledge of good and evil, turn it into law, and tempt you to use your knowledge of good and evil to condemn yourself and so trap yourself in the illusion that you are the judge, which blinds you to the judgment, the judgment that all is forgiven and you are thoroughly, completely, and absolutely loved. Father, forgive them. It is finished, said the end who is the beginning and the way through space and time to our home. God's rest, the seventh day. Isaiah 43, 25, listen to this closely. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake, my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. One of my old seminary professors, Chuck Kraft, once told me about a Lutheran pastor stuck in a cycle of sin. He kept asking for forgiveness and then, you know, committing the same sin over and over and over again. One night, alone in the sanctuary of his church, just plagued by guilt, he confessed his sin and then he just dropped to the floor and he began crawling toward the altar, weeping and begging God for forgiveness. And, and, and then suddenly in the dark, alone in that place by himself, crawling toward the altar, he heard a voice. What are you doing? Said the voice. I'm begging for the forgiveness of my sin, he answered. What sin? Said the voice. That voice was not the voice of the accuser. That voice was the voice of the judge. Your dad. I am that I am. Reality. And that night was the turning point in that pastor's life. 
There's so much to say about the cycle of addiction and how not trusting in grace just leads us back into the arms of our idols. Idols like food, alcohol, shopping, gossip, pornography, resentment, rage, etc., etc., etc. But the most dangerous idol of all is the self. The self that thinks it saves itself, justifies. I mean, that's really why you get addicted to all that stuff. You're trying to save yourself. The self that thinks it saves itself, justifies itself, and so creates itself, that is the self that doesn't believe that it's forgiven. That the self is forgiven of everything that's anything. It's the self that doesn't know that everything is grace. It's your arrogant ego. In Philippians 3, Paul writes, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. And yet this is weird, he just listed what lies behind. He just described how he had been blameless under the law and so trusted in his own ability to take knowledge of good and evil and uh, use it to make choices and so uh, judge himself, justify himself and create himself in the image and likeness of God. So do you understand what Paul is saying? Sin is not just, it's not just one side of your piece of paper, your failures. Sin is also how you have attempted to correct those failures with your judgments, which you think of as your success, your your righteousness, it's self-righteousness. And so sin is not just your unrighteousness, and check this out, it's not just your self-righteousness, sin is attempting to fill out this paper at all. And now you may be saying, oh, great, Peter, I come to church and, and uh, you lead me into temptation. Yep. <laughs> but I don't think I really led you into temptation. I think you live there all the time. I led you into confession. I'm saying that sin is attempting to justify yourself with works of the law. And righteousness is faith that you have been justified by grace. Even this faith is the work of God's grace, his judgment of love, his his word, which has a name, Jesus. In Colossians, Paul tells us that God canceled out our certificate of debt by nailing it to the cross. And so this morning, we're going to nail your knowledge of yourself, which is your judgment of yourself, to the cross. Your certificate of debt. Debt, for if there's anything that you owe God... The judge, it's your judgment. So we're going to remember to forget, but we're also going to remember. Paul wrote, for, this is, Paul wrote, forgetting what lies behind, and yet he obviously remembers what he did in the past because he just describes what he did in the past. God declares, I will not remember your sins, and yet he clearly remembers everything we've done. I mean, he's omniscient. Jeez, come on, that's obvious in Scripture. Perhaps he doesn't remember our sins, for sin is actually not something that is done. Jesus even said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Perhaps sin is the shape of faithlessness, the shape of lovelessness, the shape of evil, which we have judged to be ourselves. It's the shape of your false self. Perhaps God doesn't remember your sin, for there's nothing to remember except the shape of nothing, which we think is the something that we refer to as ourselves. Perhaps God remembers that he was crucified in Christ Jesus and that we did pound the nails, but he does not remember that we took his life because that's an illusion. Jesus even said, no one takes my life from me. Perhaps God doesn't remember that we took his life, for he knows that from the foundation of the world, he gave his life even made the metal that we use to make the nails. He's never lost control. In other words, all your sin is like an empty place, the shape of a temporal nothing, which is being filled with an eternal something. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, wrote Paul. So this morning, we'll remember to forget our sins. We'll nail them to the tree where they have been crucified with Christ. This morning, we'll remember to forget our sins and remember that on the night he was betrayed by all of us, he said, do this in remembrance of me. 
This is my body broken for you. This is my life. The life is in the blood given to you. This is the theos physis, the divine nature. And you know, I'm not simply talking about wheat and grapes, right? But the thing that's in it. This is the faith that is filling your faithlessness. Uh, this is the love that is filling your lovelessness. This is the reality that's filling your illusions. This is the eternity that fills our temporality. This is I am that I am filling I am not. What the church fathers called theosis. This is God's judgment of you and it's God's judgment within you. Every good judgment in you is God in you, the divine nature, and every bad judgment in you is nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing, said the Word of God. And in him, I can do all things, said the Word of God in Paul. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in, in me. Verse 10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. How do you confirm that someone has called you? By calling yourself? No. How do you confirm that someone has chosen you? By choosing yourself? No. How do you confirm that someone has elected you? By electing yourself? No. How strange is it that the church is actually taught that you are saved by grace through faith and this faith is not your own, but then taught that in order to confirm your salvation, you need to come to church. Why? Well, we got knowledge of good and evil. So that you can use it to make all the right choices and so confirm God's choice in you. So you can judge yourself. That sounds satanic. Adam confirmed God's choice by making it for him. He's dependent on you. And yet it's not as if our choices don't matter. When we choose illusion, we simultaneously reject reality, the reality of love and of truth and of freedom. There is no deeper hell than sin, according to Julian of Norwich. Sin is the outer darkness, even if you don't recognize it when it first starts creeping in. Sin is the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. It's the nightmare in which we've trapped ourselves until the word of the Father wakes us from our illusions. Verse 10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these, you will not fall. For in this way, there will be richly choreographed for you the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Faith and love, you see, are not only the way into the kingdom, they are the kingdom. Verse 12, therefore, I intend always to remind, that is, give you a new mind, remind you of these, faith, virtue, goodness, righteousness, love. So, so what do we do when we realize that those things are missing in parts of us? Judge ourselves and try harder in the power of the flesh? No. No. We confirm our calling and election. We remember to forget our former sins and remember that the divine nature has been given to us and is who it is that we actually are. That's why we come to worship, to be reminded. It's our fallen minds, our psyches that keep us from the knowledge of God. And so we gather to forget our knowledge of ourselves, our judgments, and to remember the judgment of God that we are known by him, and now we know him, and all things with him.
I have a niece named Elena who doesn't know much. At least not much stuff. She has Down syndrome. But my sister Lydia always taught Elena that she is known by God and thoroughly loved by God, and so Elena knows God. If a person's worth is measured by their ability to take knowledge of the good and make themselves good in a room full of people, Elena uh, just doesn't seem to measure up. But Elena knows that she's priceless. She's known by God, and so she knows things that most people don't know, for it turns out that he's delighted to just tell her stuff <laughs> and show her stuff. My sister told me that one day when Elena was asked by someone at their church, because they had to ask this question in order to work in the nursery or something like that, when did you meet Jesus? Without hesitation, she responded, when Oppie died. Oppie is what she called my dad. And when he died, she was in the room with him along with my sister Lydia. Lydia had told me, because I'd been there and he'd come back right after he died. Lydia told me how dad pointed excitedly at the corner of the room. And Elena, who was just like a toddler at the time, seemed to know what was going on. A year later, visiting my mom as they walked in the room where my father died, Elena suddenly just grew very excited and said, he fly and fly and fly and fly. And Lydia looked at Elena, who had to have been about four, I don't know, four, six years, something like that at this time. She looked at Elena and she said, did you see Oppie fly? And she said, yes, and the angels and, and Jesus. <laughs> Fifteen years later, when my mom died, Lydia and Elena uh, weren't with her. They were in a hotel room. I think it was in Oklahoma coming back from a horse show. In the morning, Lydia, with a lot of trepidation, broke the news to Elena. Oh, we died. And Elena said, I know. I saw Oppie last night. He said that he and Jesus were going to get Oe because she's very tired. On Thursday of last week, I got a a call at four in the morning. I had just fallen asleep because I have trouble sleeping. Singing, dancing, laughing, not now, weeping sometimes and, and sleeping. It was my brother-in-law, Tom. Tom knows a lot of stuff. I mean, seriously, he's a genius. He, right now, he's... he's working on heading up this project to synchronize three supercomputers for some government agency or something or to, to coordinate satellite telescopes around the world so that they can peer into deep space. I mean, he knows a lot of stuff, but he didn't know what to do. He was utterly undone, sobbing as he told me, Lydia's gone. I came home late from work, must have been about midnight, because he's working on his, all this stuff. He said, I came home late from work and I found her sitting in her chair and, and she's gone. I can't remember how long we talked, but he was just a wreck, wretch. And when I hung up, I thought, oh my God, how's he gonna tell Elena? Later the next day, I, I called him from Tucson where we had gone to see my son Coleman. He answered the phone and he sounded sad and yet surprisingly hopeful. In fact, he was chuckling in, in places. He said, Peter, when I finally went into Elena's bedroom to tell her that mommy had died, I just didn't know what to say. But when I woke her and told her, she said, I know mommy is with Jesus. And Peter, she seemed a little confused that I was so confused. He said, Peter, Elena, Elena was there. I discovered that she was there. She told me that she went to the refrigerator to get mom a, a soda. And when she came back, she, she found that Lydia was, she didn't know if she was asleep. She just was, she was silent. She wasn't there. So she drank the soda. Then she put the pizza in the oven, burned the pizza, then put it in the refrigerator for me when I got home because I had been uh, calling. And then she said at some point she realized that Lydia was dead. Gone. 
He said, I'm still sorting it out, but she told me that God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or some angels or all of the above told her that mommy was with Jesus. She was safe. And she could put herself to bed. And so she did. She fell asleep in a little boat. Oh, no, just an absolutely raging sea. Because reality is not what you know, but who it is that knows you. And so he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the covenant, the eternal covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the morning, on a tree in a garden, he calmed the raging sea. This is your knowledge of yourself. This is God's knowledge of you. His opinion of you, how he sees you, his life in you. This is your judgment. We just nailed it to a tree. This is God's judgment. Relentless love. You are not what you've done. You are what God is doing. And what God does is eternal. Paradigm shift. So feel free to sing and dance. Feel free to weep and laugh. Feel free to take a nap. It's Sunday. Amen? And so, Lord God, we thank you that there's a part of us that we're conscious that there's a part of us that believes what we just sang. And Jesus, that's you in communion with us. And God, we thank you that you have just revealed that there's a part of us that does not believe what we just sang, and it's actually nothing. So thank you, Lord God, for filling our nothing with your something. Thank you, Lord God, that you promise, this is one of your promises, that you will fill all things through Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. <laughs> so God, we just thank you. In, in his name, not because it's like magic or something, but because it means salvation. That's what you do, God. Dad, our dad, we like you. 
Amen. Amen. And now my wife whispered in my ear, someone put a check in the plate. So uh, we're going to dispose of that. <laughs> but we'll, we won't read it. We'll just look for the check, right? So we'll put it in the plate. But if you do have a check or uh, gold bullion, whatever, you can put it in the baskets at the back there, and that's uh, most appreciated. But this is important. This is why we come to church. Back in the 80s, I used to think that my job was to give everybody the not, so like, you know, if a, if a businessman came to church, and this really freaked me out, because for a while we had the president of Coors and the president of Coors Tech. Well, I was supposed to tell them how to be a good president of Coors, and I'm like, I don't know how to do that, and you know, Tom, uh, was, I think he's down in the entryway. He was just here. Tom was there. And, well, well, and Rick, was the, you were the CEO of um, well, Quest, right? Something like that. I'm like, I don't know how to be the CEO of Quest. Tom's a doctor. I don't know how to be a doctor. What, what is it that, that I'm supposed to do? To tell you how to be all those things? No, I'm supposed to remind you of who you are. And that there's a seed in you. And when you love, well, you can do all things whether you're the president of this or that or a doctor or whatever, because uh, love is ultimately who you are. That, your judgment of yourself is not who you are. This, God's judgment of you, is who you are. You're his kids. All of that to just say, believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.